Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at Hageman Library. We're really excited to have Al Ruggiero with us tonight. Um, he's gonna play the saxophone for us. Um, he's gonna start out playing uh, Those Were the Days. And um, he's gonna talk tonight about his, um, his late wife um, wrote a book of essays and poems called Pearls from Carol. So he's gonna talk about um, talk about that and and play some songs for us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for having you. So a little music to begin. <laughs> and uh, very little bit about the beginning and how it all got started because I'm not an odyssey and now you are all part of the odyssey. And uh, Carol passed in 2020, as I said, or I didn't, and uh, I was, uh, it was three days after the funeral, I was at the kitchen table with a whole stack of her writings and I uh, was going through them, remembering them all because she always read them to me before she delivered them. And I got a phone call from a lady who I know for a long time, her name is Linda Whitaker. And we're talking and she's asking me all kinds of questions. And then I say, well, I'm sitting at the table with this big pile of writings. I guess I'm gonna donate them to the senior center. And she says in her commanding voice, no, you can't do that. You gotta do something with that. So I thought about it. I put them away and that Monday, I put them back out again at the table. I started sorting them into what I perceived as chapters. And uh, I took the whole matter to Tycho, New Haven, and I made 22 of these. This is like the unabridged version. And uh, uh, much of it is in her own writing, which I know you can't see too well. And, uh, but they, they did a great job, and they, they put pictures where I wanted them to put, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I made 22 of these, and I gave 20 away. And then I took it a step farther. I said, if I got this much, let me go farther. And I, I had the book published. And my main reason to have it published was to get it in the Library of Congress, which it is. And that's a big deal. And then the Odyssey kept on going. And uh, I was looking for publicity. And it's, a, it's available if you, if you look for it. This is the uh, Milford Magazine. It comes out four times a year. And uh, they did a wonderful article. On, uh, on the, the book and on Carol, very, very good. And lots of other people. I was interviewed by Channel 8 and Channel 12, Suzanne Goldklang, who is now semi-retired. They came to the house and uh, the man with the, uh, with the camera and I gave an interview, it was just wonderful. So it goes on. And the Odyssey keeps going. Uh, I've been doing this now for over two years. That is making a uh, uh, appearances all over the place. These are just some of the the advertisements of different places I've been. And uh, it's a lot of fun to see how different librarians and other people uh, advertise. It's always fun to see how they put their twist on things, you know. And this, this particular library did that one beautiful job. And so uh, we're going to begin exploring Carol's world. And so we're going to cut the lights here, yes. and uh, I hope you enjoy it. And by the way, it's available everywhere, and we'll get to that. So, okay. I begin by asking myself a question, why do people write in the first place? And it seems like a simple question, and it is. And I, I looked at four authors to see how they describe the writing process. 
because this is all a learning experience for everybody. And I began with Mark Twain, who was so much fun, and he's writing in the 19th century, and he said, substitute damn every time you're inclined to write very, your editor will delete it, and your writing will be just as it should be. So he's saying something there. And hold that thought. I'll um, take a look at Jack London. You can't wait for inspiration, you have to go after it with a club. And then check off. Very good. Don't tell me the moon's shining. Show me the glimmer of light on broken glass. Show me. And then Jefferson, to sum it up, the most wonderful of all talents is that of never using two words when one will do. So there you have it. This is essentially what you have to know to be a writer. The rest comes from you. So opening thoughts, we're not going to spend too much time here. I observed Carol writing any time of the day. I saw how enthused she was in doing it. She would always run by her writings to me. My conclusion, writing, as in all forms of art, is extremely private and personal. And writers, as in all arts, they expose their inner thoughts and emotions. It is no wonder that artistic creations and expressions can easily cause elation when praised and dejection when laughed at. It's a very touchy thing to be a writer. So in a writing group, you sit around a table and you read your piece and people go around and critique it. And that's very painful. You have to be able to take that sort of thing. So for most writers, writing is a chance to create their own world and allow the rest of us to wander to it. So let's wander, shall we? Uh, we're not going to get into this too much. This is all in the forward of the book. Uh, Dorothy Close was the inspiration for getting her into this writing club. She, her interest was ceramics, and you'll see that later. But she joined, and uh, she stayed for 20 years. She really found that she enjoyed it. Uh, her writing style immediately drew praise. She enjoyed telling a story and turning a serious topic on its head. She was very good at that. Uh, she really enjoyed expressing herself in writing and having fun with it, and that's the key, fun. And as I said in the, in the book, this is a book that is never meant to be. Carol was published twice in Reminisce magazine. But um, when I said, well, let's take it farther, she said, no, I've done that. It was a very nice experience. But uh, she was very unpretentious. So let's enjoy the ride and uh, have a little fun. This is the philosophy as it boils down. Show, don't tell. Very important. Uh, write about what you know. The fewer words, the better. Mark Twain. Uh, don't use big words to impress. That's it. I know courses are written about this, but this is what it amounts to. So, <coughs> these are some of the places I've uh, been doing what I'm doing right now. And uh, it goes on. And I'm, I'm booking to uh, September. And then I don't know. But uh, it's been quite an odyssey. And very nice people I met along the way. So a little excerpt. Let's warm up, shall we? The people that bring out the best of me. Friends who have seen me at my worst. I feel comfortable with true friends. We can talk about anything and never worry about offending. We always find common ground and turn tears to smiles. Friends bring out the best of me, and I hope I bring out the best in them. Sure? To the point? This is pretty funny. Sandra D. Goodbye, Sandra D. As a teenager in the 50s, getting ready for a date was an ordeal. It meant getting out the umbrellas. Not that I feared rain, in fact, I would never carry an umbrella on a date, it just would not be cool. Instead, I used the umbrellas to shape my horsehair crinolines. Using a long wooden spoon, I stirred sugar to hot water and soaked the crinolines in this mixture. As they dried, the sugar stiffened the fabric. Getting dressed, I slipped a full circular skirt over the stiff crinolines. I tied my hair into a ponytail with a sheer pink scarf and giggled, well, look at me, I'm Sandra D. I'm sure my date would approve. The years passed, as did Sandra D. I no longer date because my husband may not approve. Today, when I tie my hair into a ponytail, I frown and say, well, look at me, I'm Willie Nelson. <laughs> Let's make soup. Writing is like making soup. Writers workshops supply the finest ingredients, beginning with a hearty stock. <clears throat> the instructor stirs and stimulates with a clever quick write. The pot begins to boil and is lower to simmer. <clears throat> As students add a dash of creativity, along with a large spoonful of friendship, they listen, learn, and blend their unique voices. Like all good soup, the results are always warm and comforting. Amen. Uh, 
Could you please shut off your cell phones? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> this is a riot. And uh, one word about it. When Carol was given a subject she didn't like, she turned it into a poem and had fun with it. And the whole, the entire last chapter of the book is on post. So where this came from, I don't know. She didn't think that much of it. But this is on the front page of the website. Why I'm late. <clears throat> there was an elephant in my driveway, and I couldn't back out the car. When I looked at my side view mirror, it warned elephants appear closer than they are. I backed out nice and easy, hoping the elephant had shrunk. We were now at a standoff, facing trunk to trunk. With the beast had tried to reason, telling him I would be late if he didn't move his tail and all the rest of his weight. He thought this quite funny. He threw his head back, touched to the sky. Twice then we made a deal, the elephant and I. If you could just inhale and get a little thinner, when I get home tonight, I'll have you in for dinner. He flapped his ears from side to side, agreeing he would wait. There was an elephant in my driveway, and that's why I'm late. <laughs> I love that. But where that came from, I have no idea. <clears throat> so in my honesty, <coughs> excuse me, I bought the book to independent bookstores, and that was nice. But I wanted more. This is a delightful little thing that uh, Carol is capable of writing, The Snow Lady. The sound of laughter breaks winter's gloomy silence and draws me to my front window. Directly across the street, Maria and her grandchildren are building a snowman. I join the laughter, realizing the sculptor is not a man at all, rather a very curvaceous snow lady. On her head sits a flower Easter bonnet, giving hope for spring. The snow lady melts into memory as Maria prepares her flower beds, laying wheelbarrows of fresh mulch. Across the street, I'm doing the same. A blur of yellow fascistias wink at lilac buds. Soon, the lilacs will bloom releasing a lavender fragrance throughout the neighborhood. Summer finds me watering pale, pink, and fuchsia-colored impatience. Maria is tending her begonias. She waves and crosses the street to chat. I ask about her grandchildren who are grown now. I mention a snow lady they built many years ago. Through teary eyes, we decide to talk about the flowers. Red and orange leaves quickly turn to rust. Autumn will carpet the lawns, and raking begins. Winter will soon arrive. I'm drawn to my front window, where I reminisce to the sound of laughter and the snow lady wearing her Easter bonnet. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very tender. So, in my quest, I took the book to uh, Adam's Market near me, and uh, <coughs> it sold out. This was from Bristol. Uh, when I gave a talk, they had a photographer there and a newsman, wonderful article. Bristol newspaper. I just pretend they do for no particular reason. So why am I doing this? If I was in the audience, I want to know why am I doing this. It's my way of honoring Carol. I may remain so very proud of her, her innate ability, her unpretentious fortitude and common sense. I want to share her unique writing and humor with as many people as possible. Encouragement. Hope to encourage everyday folks to develop their writing skills. And of course, this little book in many ways helps me hold on to Carol. So that's that. We're not going to read this one. It's about Carol's experience with beavers. There were beavers in a, in a pond next to her. And she used to write about it. And by the way, look at the top left. It says Ace of Spades. Whenever Carol wrote, she would pull a card. Now what the meaning was, I had no idea. Never asked. I opened the closet door, and my husband's hat fell from the shelf. I picked it up, and another fell, then another. How many hats does this guy need, I said aloud. I was sure he only had one head. I stood on a chair and began sorting. <coughs> Dress hats, stacking the largest brim on the bottom. Stetsons, fedoras, and a safari hat took another row. It was obvious he was ready for anything, like a cattle drive or a raging bull elephant. Straw yard hats to protect his bald head were next. Woolen hats for snow folded easily. Baseball caps and logos complete the collection. Baseball caps? He doesn't know the Yankees from an ice hockey team, but the visors are perfect for reading outdoors. I'm surprised I didn't come across at least one sombrero. I gave the sombrero away. <laughs> I did that one. Satisfied, I hopped off the chair and closed the door. <clears throat> when my husband arrived home, he opened the closet door, removing his hat. Oh, wow, you organized all my hats. Where should I put this one? I was about to tell him, but instead decided to get dinner on the table. Later, I heard the mail truck and opened the closet door to get my coat. Hats tumbled to the floor. I accidentally stepped on one, then jumped on two. I want to set fire to the rest as I scream, 
How many hats do you need? He laughed. I don't know. How many pocketbooks do you have? I picked up the hats and was grateful we weren't talking about shoes. So that's Dorothy <coughs> to the right, and she got her into the writing group, and they were best friends, and her husband and I were best friends, and they were just absolutely wonderful people. <coughs> so encouraged, I took it to Chakra, I got permission, and then sold out. Just to go there and check it out every day. A lot of fun. Well, <coughs> these are the libraries and other places I've been to. The book is in 175 libraries that I can recall. And only one I'm gonna talk about. I was looking at a list of Connecticut libraries and the Connecticut State has a library and I said, I wanna be in there. So I called the lady, couldn't get her, couldn't get her, finally got her and her name was Carol. I said, this is a good moment. So we talked and she said, well, I'll look at it and give back to me, okay. So that was Monday. <clears throat> that Saturday I was playing in my high school alumni band and I was asking the fellows next to me what I do for a living one said, I'm an engineer. The other said, I work for the state Republican headquarters. Very interesting. So he called his boss, who called me that Monday. He said, we'd like to do this. I sent him an email. I said, what should I do? He said, do nothing. So that Friday, I couldn't wait anymore. I called, got a hold of Carol. She said, we'd love to have your book, bring it in. So I don't know what the influence was, but it's in the state capitol. It's in Yukon, it stores. It's in Southern Connecticut. It's in the New Haven Historic Society. Yes. It's in, uh, <clears throat> I forget the numbers, seven in Rhode Island, five in New York, three in Jersey, and three in Massachusetts. Then, or during the same time, I started calling uh, Barnes and Nobles. The book is available in Barnes and Nobles, but you have to order it. I didn't like that. So <clears throat> I started calling from Alaska to Hawaii, moving across the country, and these people brought it in. And it was an amazing experience. I put down the people I talked to, who were probably not there now, but uh, it's a lot of fun calling uh, Oglethorpe, Georgia, you know. We were on Fifth Avenue for a while. Isn't that great? So they all have it in their stores now? Yes. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, they did then. It was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So this is how the book is divided. The original day when I was sitting down and sorting things out using my own terminology. I like the words whimsy, I like that. Potpourri is fun. Only one thing I kept separate, the Emotion Tea Party, because it's the only very serious thing she wrote that I know of. And uh, I used to use it in AP Psychology. And I think it's very profound. And plenty of people across the country have gotten back to me on that. This is what her publication party looked like. <laughs> and there was a big deal once a year. They'd go and uh, read their pieces. And the lady who ran the whole show was Madeline Celestri. And I was doing this in Monroe. And uh, the lady said to the library, she, she's my grandma. I mean, uh, she's since passed, but she was a lot of fun. And her husband, Alex. You don't meet finer people than that. So here we go. <clears throat> This is the only serious thing, okay? They have been with me throughout my life. Never invited, always controlling, and mighty than myself. This is the first time I will see them together. I will be able to observe their interactions. So I've never seen each other. Others go hand in hand, visiting me when they please, and leaving only when they decide the visit is over. And me knowing, always knowing, they will visit again. The tea table is lavishly set with silver tea service, china cups, lacy linens, fragrant flowers, trays of sprinkled cookies, and little cakes for pastel icing. I've changed the seating arrangement several times. The only place card not moved is my own. At the head of the table, well, I will pour and try to be polite to those I wish were not there. Who will be the first to arrive, I wonder? My question is quickly answered as I see greed coming up the garden path. Of course, who else? She must always be first. She doesn't frighten me at all. She's the one who visits me the least, and I'm grateful for that. Behind her comes confusion, not knowing which way to go, <clears throat> but always wanting to do the right thing. I watch her as she trips and falls, becoming disoriented, as she tries to follow the path. Next come the twins, 
dressed in their bright green outfits, accenting their blazing green eyes. Yes, they are jealousy and envy. They look so much alike, and yet there is a slight difference in their appearance. They will watch the others closely and never find satisfaction in who they are or what they have, only and always wanting what is not theirs to have. Love. Love comes unexpectedly next. Her starry eyes, moist with tears, <clears throat> will recede between happiness and sadness. She is much stronger than most of the guests, <clears throat> but at the same time very tender and easily hurt. Hate is next, dragging rage and anger, chained to her scarlet garment. She comes when outrageous injustice has been come. She comes when demons laugh and get their way and leave me beaten, hopeless, and in despair. Many, many more fill the chairs around this enormous tea table. Only two are empty now, one to my immediate right, as close to me as possible, the other the farthest away, as I dread her coming. She is grief. She's the strongest of all. <clears throat> I watch her now coming up the path, dragging her crippled legs, pulling her deformed body inch by inch as I feel fear reaching out for me. Her party dress is gray, her complexion is ashen as she looks at me with yellowish eyes and remembers the sounds of wretched wailing and weeping. She rejoices as she tries to take my mind, my body, my inner soul. Stay away, grief. Drink your tea. Eat your cake and go. The last guest, dressed in brilliant white, is my intimate friend. Her name is Peace. She's the most beautiful of all. She pops in and out of my life. She's the one I need the most. She and only she is the one I want with me through eternity. She's the one, the only one I embrace <clears throat> and beg to stay with me long after this emotional tea party has ended. Sorry, my voice. Pretty good, huh? Excellent. That's amazing. This is funny. The Pink Scarf. During the 1950s, rock and roll music filled the lives of most teenagers. I was no exception. Summers were spent at Pleasure Beach Amusement Park, where rock and roll <clears throat> celebrities entertained. I remember the night the Emily Brothers harmonized, opening the show for Chuck Berry, who had a new hit song called Carol. He came on stage with his guitar, struck a chord, and shouted to the audience, Where you at, Carol? Where you at? Carol was a common name in the 50s, so of course there was always a Carol in the audience. I'm here, I squealed with delight. I was escorted to the stage and stood with Chuck Berry as he dunk walked around me and sang Carol. Around my neck, I wore a pink scarf. It was a style for teenage girls to wear pastel-colored neckerchiefs, like the Living Newton John and Stockard Chaining in a musical Greece. And let's not forget Natalie Wood in Rebel Without a Cause. Her co-star, James Dean, was my heart's well. I must remind you, this was 60 years before Kevin Costner. In the movie, Jimmy wore his red jacket, but it was Natalie who wore that pink scarf. When Chuck Barry finished singing, he gave my scarf a little tug and thanked me for joining me on stage. When I got home that night, I tucked the scarf away and kept this precious memory. There will never be another Chuck Barry or another pink scarf. But First date, it's pretty funny. First date, the fragrance of apple blossoms filled the air. Soon I would be 12 years old. I packed the lunch along with my Nancy Drew book and headed to the apple orchard where I climbed the highest tree and nestled among the blossoms. This is what heaven must be like, I thought. Opening my book and munching on peanut butter sandwiches, two yellow bees joined me. While flickering them away, I heard my friend Gordy calling. I'm up here, Gordy. He answered, I thought I'd find you here. Do you want to go to the stream and catch salamanders? Not today, I said. I want to be alone. Gordy climbed the tree and our eyes met between the branches. There was something different about him today. He seemed serious and grown up. Was it the rise of spring that turned the boy into a young man? With a slight stutter, he asked, Will you go on a date with me tomorrow? I didn't know if I was old enough to go on a date, but did not want to disappoint Gordy. Sure, I answered. Where will we go? Gordy smiled, his wonderful smile. To the movies, he answered. The next day, I got ready for my first date. I don't remember what I wore, 
but I remember coming up with a pretty pink bolero jacket. It was the color of apple busts. We took the bus, the bus to the Lowe's Pole Ice here in Bridgeport, where we watched Doris Day and Gordon McCraig paddling a canoe while singing on Moonlight Bay. The movie was almost over when Gordy put his arm around my shoulder. I didn't like that. Count to five and threw it off. We barely spoke on the long bus ride home. The next morning I went back to the apple orchard and sat high in a tree. I had a lot of thinking to do. <laughs> this is wild. It's a true story. The secret of William Tell and Annie Oakley. The voice on the phone said, Hi, it's Pat. Gruffly, I answered, Pat, I don't know any Pat. How can you forget your best friend from childhood, she giggled. Patty, when did you start calling yourself Pat? I think you for often and I always look forward to your Christmas card. You know, the one that says, I'll call you soon. What made you call today? I heard the William Tell Overture on the radio this morning. Most would think of the Long Ranger shouting, Hi, yo, Silver, but not me. Do you remember our William Tell experience? Of course I do. How can I forget? You made me swear not to tell anyone our secret. I vowed to take it to the grave. At times, I hoped for an early death. My mind traveled back and visiting the summer of 1948. Patty and I were digging a hole just deep enough to bury potatoes. We were sure the sun would bake them during the day and planned on returning in the evening to eat them dirt and all. We saw Patty's older sister, Maureen, coming towards us. She was always hanging out with the boys, and today was no different. Peter Putnick was with her playing William Tell. She and Peggy claimed to have made an exact replica of Tell's bow and arrow from a willow twig and a piece of kite string. When Maureen pulled the weapon, the string broke and the twig snapped in half. Embarrassed, she said, Oh, boys don't know anything. Any Oakley was a better marksman than William Tell. Looking directly at me, Maureen said, I know where my father hides his World War II rifle. I'll get it, or you run home and get an apple. We didn't have any apples, but there was a bowl of oranges on the table waiting to be squeezed. Mom will never miss this one, I thought, selecting the largest. Maureen ordered Petey to take ten paces back and place the fruit on his head. He obeyed. The butt of the rifle was against Maureen's shoulder as she looked through the sight and aimed. The shot ran through the air. Orange Ryan flew, and Petey fell to the ground. Terrified, I screamed, Maureen shot Petey. Maureen shot Petey. Patty shook her finger at her sister. You're going to get it when Dad gets home. You kill Petey. You'll be grounded for a month. They'll ground me too. Petey's dead body stirred. We ran to him. He told us he heard the shot, felt the warm juice, thinking of blood, passed out cold. Somehow Maureen had hit the orange dead center. <laughs> we put the gun back in his hiding place and vowed never to tell anyone. <laughs> Patty and I returned to the potato, potato hole and silently dug. I still believe William Tell and Aoki were digging with us, for no Marine could never have hit that orange. You think of that, an M1 rifle, 12 year old girl. Ten paces back. Truly unbelievable. So, here's an idea of the uh, articles in Reminisce. And we're not going to read it, but the last part I love. Very last paragraph. The next day at school finally arrived, but I was disappointed to learn my mother had to come with me. I couldn't wait for her to leave. Only then would I feel grown up. Her last instruction before introducing me to my teacher, Miss Trotter, don't forget to use your hanky when necessary. Miss Trotter smiled at me and said, My, what a lovely hanky you're wearing. It was difficult to hear her, as most of the kids were lying on the floor, crying and yelling for their mothers. I stepped over one of them I knew, Peter Caval, who was wailing and turning blue. I knelt next to him and said, Don't cry, Peter. We're growing up now. I love that. Then I unpinned my hanky and wiped away his tears. When I got home from school, my mother asked, did you use your new hanky? Yes, I answered, I did. <laughs> and, 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 there it is. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Is it a big C? Oh, yeah. That is beautiful. There's some stuff, stuff like that right in wish for it. Okay. Oh, we're not going to read this one. How long? It's about the color amber. And she was fascinated by the word. What's amber? Amber ways. What's amber? Should ask a teacher. A little thing I like. The sounds of summer past. Croaking frogs beneath my bedroom window. Alvin, Audrey, Paul. Mrs. Otto's call for dinner. The echoing clickety-clack of kick the can under a dim street light. 
creaking rocking chairs on the front porch, the ice band tongs cracking chunks and slivers, women in white aprons snapping green beans, dropping into a metal colander, squealing children running through a rubber garden hose, the ragman's horse clopping slowly up the street, slippery salamanders splashing in a stagnant pond, the ice cream man's bells, wait up, wait up. These are the sounds of summer past. And one time uh, they were fascinated by the fact that there were horses around there. So, yeah, there were a few horses around. Remember the horse? I remember. No, I remember. I remember the ragman. Oh, yeah. And this true story, I know she wrote about half the stuff that we did. Angels never sleep. Years ago, my husband and I were traveling to Canada on a tour bus looking forward to sightseeing and relaxation. After a stop for lunch, the bus driver announced we would not be stopping for another four hours. When he started the engine, I found it amusing that everyone immediately fell asleep. Everyone except me, that is. My fear of traveling allows no sleep. Instead, I spent my time listening to my husband snore and looking at the back of the bus driver's head, which now fell forward onto the steering wheel. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. At a high rate of speed, the bus was swerving over a bridge. I looked at the icy water below and knew we were all going to die. I thought of waking my husband, but decided uh, to spare him the terror. Thanks to some hardworking angels, we made it across the bridge. But once again, the bus picked up speed, crossing two lanes into oncoming traffic. At this point, everyone was screaming. Thankfully, two doctors were on board. The psychiatrist spoke softly to the driver while the medical doctor tried to calm the passengers. Suddenly, the bus lifted and fell, flew off the road into a ravine where the engine died. The engines were back, they never sleep. It turns out that the driver was doing cocaine in between. Wow. We didn't know that, but we refused to get back on the bus with him. So we waited four hours for the send someone else. Beastly man, I'm not going to read it. All kinds of stuff. Greener clubs, see that? Like a book, life has many chapters. At different times, different things are important. My husband, family, and friends are always important. This never changes. Some things that seemed important at the time proved unimportant later in life. The most important thing now is knowing what will remain forever important. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> True story. True story. The canoe. <coughs> Friday had finally arrived, and I was looking forward to spending the weekend with my husband, Al. He told me he had a surprise plan. I was amazed when he pulled into the driveway with a large canoe strapped to the roof of the car, 16 feet. He talked to me to some pretty wild adventures in the past, but no way was I getting in that canoe. I'm not going canoeing, I said. I can't even swim, let alone paddle. I've never been in a canoe before. Alvin answered, this is the first time for everything. We headed upstate to Cornwall. The canoe hung over the windshield and looked like the beak of a large eagle. I began to see rental shops and wonder why Albert hadn't rented the canoe instead of hauling the eagle all this distance. He explained he got a good bar and he couldn't pass it up. We pulled to a station where two men unloaded the canoe and put on an all-terrain vehicle. The driver took us through a forest and then straight down a very steep embankment. I was sure this was the most frightening part of the day. <laughs> At the shore, Albert told me to get in first. I couldn't understand why. I was in the front of the ship. And where was the steering wheel? I also noticed the seat was missing and started to complain. Albert said, so the seat is missing. Sit on the floor. There's a paddle for you. The handle of the paddle was broken and jagged. But Albert told me not to worry, because he would do all the paddling anyway. <laughs> when my husband hopped into the canoe, my aunt came out of the water. Shouldn't I be touching the water, I said. <laughs> Stop worrying about every little detail, he answered. The direction from the truck drive <laughs> were to follow the stream for six miles. He would pick us up at the other end. Six miles didn't seem a great distance. It should last about 20 minutes. All this fun, all this way for 20 minutes of canoeing fun. The water was calm. Then I started to relax, tidying my clothes. I'd worn a navy blue and white yacht, yachting outfit, cute little white shoes, and of course, I never went anywhere without wearing pantyhose. Captain Albert began to give me the rules. You have to sit Indian style. This helps balance the canoe. Most of all, remember, never... Never stand up, no matter what happens, because we will tip over. My heart was pounding, <laughs> and it hurt sitting in in style. And one of the Indians were always on the warpath. <laughs> Here's a little jacket, just a, a life jacket, just in case, Albert said, throwing me a bright orange stain with broken straps and buckles. It looked uncomfortable. It didn't match my outfit. I tossed it aside. 
As we approached the beautiful Cornwall covered bridge, I heard a loud rumbling. At this point, the riverbed suddenly dropped and we were angry white waters of the mighty Housatonic River. I screamed, turn around, turn around. I'm not going through that, I can't swim. We'll never make it. Trying to make you believe there was hope, Albert shouted above the roar, remember, I got a mirror badge and Boy Scouts for canoeing. There's no way to turn around this current. Hang on, I'll get us through. I screamed, oh my God, we're gonna die. <laughs> I undotted my legs, slipped off my shoes, and wondered what it was like to drown. What would my battered body look like when they dragged me in by my soggy pantyhose? Huge rocks were scraping against the canoe, making horrible airy noises. I closed my eyes and we crashed. Go to the middle. We had landed on top of a large slippery rock pile in the middle of the river. <laughs> uh, our troubles had worsened. I looked back to see if Albert was still on board. I didn't want to die alone. This was the first time I saw this man who was never afraid of anything look beaten. He shouted to me above the roar of the white water. We're not going to make it, Carol. If I've ever done anything to hurt you, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. <laughs> there was nothing to forgive, I screamed back. Do you know what you can do with that mirror badge? If you ever got out of this alive, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> One way or another, this was the end for that boy scout. <laughs> Our only hope was to get free from the rocks. The water was lifting and smashing us back down. I knew the eagle couldn't take much more. To make matters worse, Albert was now saying to Hail Mary, and he was standing. He pushed the paddle against the rock, and the water lifted us. The canoe was airborne. We splashed down into the mighty current as Albert yelled, Paddle, paddle, and stay close to the rocks. I reached for my broken piece of wood and tried to copy his motion. About a mile later, the water began to calm. I thought it must be hallucinating for the trauma, as I saw a man wearing hip boots trout fishing. He was definitely standing. I jumped out of the canoe, pulled like a mule on the Erie Canal, until we reached the embankment. I continued to pull the canoe on dry land up a steep hill with Albert still in it. The driver had been searching for us and picked up us up at the road. As he loaded the canoe into the truck, he asked, well, how was it? <laughs> Neither of us answered. I knew he was never going to speak to Albert again. <laughs> but uncontrollable laughter set in. Tears streamed down my face as I said, look, I ruined my pantyhose. <laughs> True story. True story. We're not going to read this except... Uh, we'll tell about it. This is the boy who welcomed Carol to the neighborhood and he was driving a silver bicycle. And she was thinking about it years later. He got a good job <clears throat> in New York. His name was Michael. And uh, the last paragraph, he called his fiance the morning of September 11th and said, the building has been hit by something. We don't know what it was, but we can't get out. There's no way up or down. I love you. Please call my parents and tell them I love them too. Michael's body was never found buried beneath the rubble, right on my street. That's a note from Madeline Celestra. <coughs> We're not going to read this one, but it is fun. Uh, Eight of Diamonds, see that? I get stressed out when there are too many men in my life. Oh, it's not what you think. The men are home repair workers. I've had days where there's a plumber under my kitchen sink fixing a pipe, while an electrician asks me to hold a flashlight while he rips out an old electrical box. The wallpaper hanger tells me we need another double roll and hopes it's in stock. The exterior painter asks the landscaper to stop kicking up dirt. An argument breaks out. The neighbors begin to call. The driveway guy is measuring footage for asphalt and stops to talk to a tree surgeon who is estimating removal of an old oak tree. I call all the men by their first names. They've been to my house several times throughout the years. They all call me ma'am. The workmen do their best to put up at me when I'm stressed. Then they say, here's the bill, ma'am. <laughs> I should really stop everything goes back to childhood yeah. I should really stop worrying about trivial things like how does one repair a bondo I began worrying in kindergarten the teacher handed out musical instruments I hoped to get the triangle but Tommy pushed ahead the wooden sticks were my next favorite I watched Mary Ann smugly click them together I began to worry I'd be left with an empty oatmeal box the teacher convinced me it was a bongo drum I worried I wouldn't be able to keep the tempo. Anxiety kept me one beat ahead of the triangle and wooden sticks. The one step ahead beat took me through life. Worry brought on anxiety and tension. Tension put a hole in my oatmeal box, so now you know. <coughs> We're not going to read this one. It's quite good. And uh, notice that she used the same term a lot, so uh, I don't know if this came first or what. Grief <clears throat> is the strongest of all emotions. 
It goes deeper than love or hate. Sadness fills the emptiness that grief has left. I am saddest when grief rears its ugly head. Sadness can be pushed aside, but grief lives forever. Interesting. Very profound. It's about her father's Oldsmobile rocket that got a lady to the hospital in time. It was a little Carol. <laughs> First community. I love this. If I were a superhero, the hardest thing about being a superhero is pulling on the tights. My shirt is spangled with a letter C, and my white cape is trimmed with sequins. Tonight, snow is falling in the city of Milford. Snowplow drivers look toward the sky. A streak of glitter catches the driver's eye. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? The other, another driver answers, no, it's Crusader Carol. They began singing. There she comes to save the day. Crusader Carol is on the way. The mayor has asked all citizens to remove vehicles from streets, but chooses not to enforce the law. Snowplow drivers must maneuver around them, leaving the street a mess. Crusader Carol stays ahead of the plows, lifting automobiles until the plows clear to the curb. She wonders why people are so inconsiderate. Are they uncaring or just plain lazy? Or do they leave their vehicles because they can? Warning should be issued. Crusader Carol continues to help the hardworking snowplow drivers. She returns home after a job well done. Now to remove the damn types. It's my single favorite thing outside of a motion tea party. Hold it up. My bedtime curfew was extended at the age of 10. At last I was allowed to watch Ralph Edwards host a TV program called This Is Your Life, sponsored by the Hazel Bishop Listed Company. I didn't recognize my other guests and waited patiently for the commercials. A model with long blonde hair and ruby lips held the jewel lipstick case as the invisible audience oohed and odd. I desperately wanted that lipstick. <laughs> I tried to get up enough courage as I looked toward my mother. The effort was wasted as the clairvoyant answered my unasked question. I'm sorry, you're not old enough. I resented needing consent. The answer was always, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. This thing called the aging process was taken forever as I listened to, I'm sorry, you cannot drive until you're 16. I'm sorry, you cannot vote until you're 18. I'm sorry, you cannot marry without parental consent until you're 21. Time passes faster, at a faster rate when one becomes the consenter. Too soon, the automatic doors open at the senior center where I found myself applying for a membership. I filled out the form only hoping to hear, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. Instead, the obliging bookkeeper handed me the official Joy of Asian card and smiled and said, that's a lovely shade of lipstick you're wearing. I fumbled through my purse, pulled out the jewel case and beamed, it's Hazel Bishop and I'm old enough. <laughs> I'm not going to read it. It's all about the color blue. You saw a picture, a painting all blue, which is just lovely. It was pretty funny, penance. As a child, I never knew what orange juice really tasted like. Every morning, my mother used my orange juice to camouflage three drops of cod liver oil. Or so she thought. The oil floated on top of the juice and smelled like a stagnant gopher's bowl. The taste was worse. I held my nose and drank it down, followed by sweetened oatmeal and butter toast. This ritual went on until I was old enough to make my own breakfast. The oatmeal remained. But I eliminated the cod liver oil by squeezing three drops into the sink. Now that I think of it, it was the only drain that never needed plunging. Every day, Mom reminded, don't forget your cod liver oil this morning. It's good for shiny hair, glowing skin, and lubricates bones and joints. I answered, I won't forget, Mom. I just used three drops. The feeling of guilt lingered day after day, but at least the neighbor's cast no longer followed me to school. I knew someday, somehow, I would pay for my cod liver oil lies. I managed to get through life with normal skin, semi-shiny hair, strong bones, until recently. My arthritic bones ached, and I felt tired and run down. I was sure my doctor had a pill for this lack of energy. I filled out his prescription and returned home. The bottle read, cod liver oil, squeeze three drops into orange juice. I'm sure it was my penance for lying to my mother. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Comedy of Errors. A lot of people can relate to this. Park in the fire zone and keep the motor running, I said to my husband. I'll only be in the store for a minute. So don't move, I'll be right out. Of course, he never listens to me. And why I thought that they would be any different was beyond me. When I rushed out of the store and hopped back into the car, 
I noticed crumpled paper cups, papers and coffee cups on the floor in front seat. I raised my voice and nag, why is this car in such a mess? It's not like you. Please clean it right now. It was then I looked over the stranger sitting behind the steering wheel with his mouth hung open. <laughs> oh, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry, I got the wrong car. <laughs> I fumbled for the door handle and struggled to get out. It was about this time his wife came out of the store and reared toward me, shaking her fist and calling me some pretty low down names. I tried to reason with the enraged woman. No, no, wait, it's not what you think. I mistakenly got in the wrong car. She refused to listen. It was now directing her fist at her innocent husband. Thanks to me, this poor guy was having a very bad day. As for my husband, witnessing the entire comedy and laughing uncontrollably, well, let's just say he was about to have a bad day. I watched her get in the car and I just said, this is fantastic. I just came. It was like watching a movie. I couldn't believe it. It was a riot. We're not going to read this, but it's my homage to my grandfather, F.O., who couldn't spell uh, or write or write his own name. But she, she wrote my name on it, so I put it in the collection. This is in the book. And it's all about growing up. And uh, there you are. You're right here. Yes. My sister, me, my cousin, my cousin, my cousin, my cousin, and Doreen Foster. And I'm not going to read it except the very last paragraph. We were very complete, as I tried to describe earlier, in our two-part world. There was no need for family get-togethers except in Christmas Eve, which would take another paper to describe. We were always together. We were living in F.O.'s three family. My grandmother was a landlord. We laughed and fought, and we were secure in our memories, as was the legacy of F.O. Yeah. It was beautiful. Beautiful. And she has a taste of it, has she? Look at yeah. <clears throat> This was an article uh, written uh, by the New Haven uh, Daily Nutmeg magazine. It's online. It was a very nice tribute, really detailed. Give you an idea of potpourri. And uh, we did that. Those are Summer Carol's uh, Ceramic Awards. Nice. Oh, wow. She had a house full. That, that's just a few. She was very good at it. Uh, we read those too. Yeah, I love this. Where's your twin? In my mirror lives my twin. She smiles back when I look in. We are 12 and full of fun. When I look back, we're 21. I'm jealous of the face I see. She's much prettier than me. I look again, now 33. A serious face is what I see. Then again at 42, where's the twin I once knew? I never noticed she had gray hair. Being twins just isn't fair. She looks quite old at 56. A face a surgeon couldn't fix. In my mirror, there's <laughs> my twin. Glad I'm not her when I look in. <coughs> Another little thing, winter poems in case you haven't guessed it. She lives in a corner of my room and never disagrees. If I say blue is red or red is blue, she concurs, this is true. She sounds like me when I'm mad, cries like me when I'm sad, laughs like me when I'm glad, best darn friend I ever had. I say hello, hello, she greets. If I lie, she will repeat. She never fails, thinks the way I do. When I have nothing to say, she is silent too, my echo. <coughs> okay, just I gotta get up and read. It's quite good. Mama put a five inside my mitten. Mama put a five inside my mitten on a cold and snowy night so long ago. Dad is running late tonight and I must tend the stew. If we're to have a Christmas tree, I need to count on you. Go down the hill and take two rights. You'll see the man with the Christmas lights strung all along the trees. Get the best a five will bring. Don't let him sell you some skipping thing. Not too big, not too small. Be sure the top is nice and tall so we can place our shiny star. I took my sled, I took some rope. My young heart was full of rope, hope. <laughs> then I would buy the perfect tree for my mom and dad and me. The five inside my mitten seemed to cut inside my hand as I pulled the empty sled across the snowy land. I saw the lights, I saw the trees, and then I saw the man. Thick woolen cap, a heavy coat, a ragged glove on just one hand. Business not, business not so good this year, he fell into another. The fear inside me rose, but then I thought of mother. Get the best of five will bring. Don't let him sell you some skippy thing. The smell of spruce, the smell of pine, made me want them all. Just then I saw the perfect tree, not too short, not too tall. I squeezed the five, then I knew I must be very thrifty. How much is this one, I asked the man. Twas then he growled, 650. I looked at his dark beard with the snow upon it as he yelled. 
Well, do you want it? Too much, said I, for such a tree. It's not that nice, I lied. I'll take six and not a penny less. That was where he sighed. I'm a five inside my mitten. My mama put it there. I think this tree is worth no more. I hope you will be fair. Take this nice one, he grabbed the tree as its yellow needles fell. Now his turn to lie, but really, I could tell. I slipped a warm five from my mitten. Give me the five, he snarled. Take the tree. He reached for his box on the shelf, stuck in the five and said to me, tie it on yourself. So home I trudged with my fine tree. Mama would be so proud of me. And that she was as dad came through the door. Where did you get such a perfect tree? He looked at her. She smiled at me. I tell you, dad, on the night I've had, I stood there oh so smitten. It all began tonight, dear dad. My mama put a five inside my mitten. The whole story is going to Carol loved donkeys. <clears throat> I could talk about that, but this says for itself. Ace of Clubs. I love little gray donkeys, timid and shy. Jacks and Jennies with dark lashed eyes. At a country fair, I read a sign. One burrow for sale. He could be mine. With long ears, he listened as I told him the plan. He lived in my backyard. I named him Dad. I with a shovel, the burrow just played. He chewed on the house. He hawed and brayed. Then the angry neighbor called to say, get rid of that donkey, now today. He knocked down the fence and ate all my grass. I love my burrow, but he's a pain in the ass. <laughs> then where this one came from, we're coming to the end here. <laughs> Billy Bob is hillbilly rushed up. No, I did. No shirt or shoes required. The tables much desired are made from ammunition crates. Curly pigtails fry and fritter while the collard greens turn bitter. Served on chips, dark brown plates. Red squirrels simmer in the stew, add a cup of Mountain Dew, then a side of lucky rabbit feet. Now your entree is complete. But say some room for dessert, wipe your mouth on your shirt, then have a wedge of yummy pasta pie. Pay your bill and leave no tip, and your pants your may add to unzip at Billy Bob's Hillbilly Restaurant. Isn't that wild? Beautiful. If I had a brother, if I had a brother, I'd knit him warm sweaters <coughs> and argyle socks. i keep all his letters tucked away in a box. At my holiday table, his seat next to mine, i toast him and clink, click, <laughs> crystal glasses of wine. i fuss with his hair, i pet his cheek, and recall the day he fell in the creek. We laughed till we cried, my brother and I, remembering childhood days gone by. I'd hug him tightly when he had to go. Just one second more, I love him so. My friend, my hero, never another. He'd always be near old if I had a brother. Uh, That's nice. She put her pet peeves into poems, as you could tell. She's on the phone just calling home. Who's driving? A comb through the hair, mascara repair, waving wet nails to dry in the air. But who's driving? I reach for the bagels, and then, then she finagles some cream cheese, squeezing hot styrofoam between naked knees. Oh, please, oh, please, who's driving? And there we are. Oh, that's beautiful. As I know. As I know. Very beautiful. I thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, the, book is, uh, the book is available everywhere. Barnes and Nobles. Uh, uh, Amazon. It's on eBay. It's on um, Kindle. It's in this library. And it's in this library. That's right. If you want to, if we can, yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you manage to do that? Yeah. We're going to show a video. Yeah, I'm going to put the light on. Can you see? Yeah, no, I got it. And this was taped at, uh, at uh, Carol's presentation party. I just got a new camera. I realized I can, I can do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there you go. I think you have to diminish this. You have to exit out of the web website on the other PowerPoint. All right. Yeah. There you go. Get a job, one man snarled. Disgraceful, said the lady walking her dog. Tom O'Malley, the cop out of the beat, felt sorry for Barney, but used his authority. Move on, Barney, or I'll have to run you in. 
Barney pleaded. I wish just this one time you would look the other way. Officer O'Malley placed his hand on Barney's shoulder and said, I'm sorry, I know times are tough, but they are for me too. The baby needs shoes and the rent is overdue. A cop doesn't make enough to make ends meet these days. He wondered why he was telling Barney his problems. He knew Barney had enough of his own. He reached into his uniform pocket and placed the dollar bill in Barney's cup. Barney dragged his oversized shoes down the street. He entered the express store and read the sign, sandwiches, three dollars. The next sign read, lottery tickets, one dollar. The next morning, Barney sat on a bench next to a man reading the newspaper. The man left the paper when his bus arrived. Barney turned to page two and read his lottery numbers. Make the checkout to Officer Tom O'Malley, he told the lottery agent. Barney the beggar stood on a busy street corner, rattling two pebbles in a tin cup. Officer O'Malley was not on his beat. Thank you. Okay, I'll get the light. You get the light. Beautiful. Thank you for coming. You got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right.